even anti-gravity. Levitation effects from spinning magnetic disks conjure up images of UFOs hovering in midair. British inventor John Serrell has led the way along these lines, but his technique is not the only approach. The remarkable works of Canadian inventor John Hutchison has drawn widespread attention from businessmen and government scientists since 1979 when he began using ultra-high electromagnetic frequencies to transform matter in some very unusual ways. It has come to be known as the Hutchison effect. The objects you're seeing um, moving there is a form of levitation by uh, translational movement, meaning that the objects become lighter and can float around, the heaviest being the barium cylinder that you see there um, with the two wires coming out of it. it tends to slide around on seven pounds of its own weight. The physics of it is self-resonation of what they call a ferromagnetic and piezoelectric barium type name uh, through a power amplifier and broad and narrow uh, bands of electrical energy going into this crystal. So the applications of this in advanced applications using free energy or zero-point energy to power it would be in uh, propulsion technologies. This is a crystal converter unit that I made about a year ago to see if the principle worked, and indeed it seems to work to this day. Um, the principles involve the Casimir effect and uh, space charge type of barrier technology in semiconductors, and um, um, a jitter activity called zero-point energy that goes through time and space the idea is to get the material inside this to interface with the uh, jittering action of zero-point energy. And moving on to what they may look like inside, I actually bring out a piece here of this material of common minerals and that, produced in a special way, and I take a reading here. And I should be getting a higher reading. I had a hot spot somewhere on here. I have here almost a half a volt, as you can see. As one can see, there's no batteries in this or anything else except this crystalline material with different uh, configurations. And this is a steady state. It's always that and has been tested up to a year's time and under stress tests also. So, which made me decide to then, of course, mount the same material in cylinders. Different cylinders, of course, there are different mixes in there, and I found that, uh, that some of the cylinders are not as powerful as this material here, or this very tiny one here. Actually, this has more power than this large artillery shell unit here. And what I want to do, of course, is to... Um, <coughs> demonstrate it in the sense of it making actual power. That means to turn a small motor. Okay, I'm attaching this to the base here. Another lead to the top, and it should spin, which it does. So you have basically this kind of material powering motors. Of course, a very small motor at this time, but scaled up in larger amounts of of material and power up to uh, several horsepower if needed. Hutchison hopes his simple That's shake and bake method of producing these crystal energy converters right. will attract investors who can right. see the potential right. of permanent batteries which never need charging. Non-toxic that will interface with zero-point energy in space and time. Hutchison's more dramatic experiments border on the paranormal and have generated more than just a passing interest from U.S. military research labs. We've had about 750 demonstrations of levitation, translational movements, uh, metallurgical samples falling apart, uh, changing into transmuted unknown metals. Uh, quite a variety of obscure types of effects, wood impregnated into uh, metals, other objects in metals, 
uh, monopole uh, magnetic fields written up in many journals. Um, quite a host or a Pandora's box of different types of effects on the outer edge of, of the scientific uh, community. In this remarkable series of video clips shot by Hutchison, we see what happens when he fine-tunes the electromagnetic frequencies aimed at target objects in his garage. subatomic level, I feel that there is a, a dimension shift activated by very conventional electrostatics, RF fields that I use, and Tesla waves that I use, that actually form a keyway that opens up another area of time and space that may activate the zero-point energy fields and interdimensional reactions, let's say, to gravitational waves and time waves, or chronons, if you wish. Perhaps we're dealing in chronons and gravitons, which are maybe particles, and somehow causing a distortion, which causes objects to simply break apart or pulsate in the center uh, of stainless steel bars and fall apart, or to become weightless. ice cream in a plastic cup. Finally, a 70-pound cannonball. What is um, interesting and also frustrating about his invention is that he's using a combination of Tesla coil and Van de Graaff to produce a very disruptive and lifting experiments, which in one case, for example, uh, actually lifts a 19-pound bushing uh, toward the ceiling just from electromagnetic fields. Now, when we analyze that, we find that there's a um, position versus time graph that we can plot and also the velocity versus time but when we actually analyze the um, acceleration versus time, it's uh, an increasing straight line. So we're forced as scientists to admit that we have a third derivative effect, which um, for my mind actually lends itself to a, a anomalous new force, which I call hyperforce, uh, because we have to take a derivative of that to finally get a flat straight line, a constantly increasing acceleration. So the Hutchinson effect has been used as a benchmark for a comparison to many other high voltage propulsion devices. Electrogravity, in other words. Now that we've witnessed the awesome potential of these revolutionary new energy sources, some interesting questions begin to surface. What are the consequences to the environment, to the very fabric of space-time itself, once we begin harnessing these little understood forces on a planetary scale? Remember the promise of nuclear energy? 
that electricity would be too cheap to meter? Are there downsides to tapping free energy that we may not be able to predict until it may be too late? We have effects which can get down now into the very fundamental thing that drives everything, the mind stuff, the connection of the mind to the body and everything. For example, if you were to generate extreme pulses, extreme powerful pulses of this so-called scalar potential stuff uh, with the hidden internal stuff, if you jerk that or hard enough, you jerk the normal smooth flow of time stream and what you really do is you snap the body loose from its mind connection. You jerk the two loose from each other. That's instantaneous death at every level. Every cell dies, every germ dies, every paramecium dies, every virus dies, the whole body dies. So obviously if you're going to try to take uh, think of energy in those enormous amounts, you're going to be extremely careful. You can't do that just willy-nilly without risking terrible effects from it. So there are some limitations that will emerge on this technology. There is a danger, however, that you may tap too much uh, zero-point energy and then, of course, these things would heat up and explode, which has happened a few times with these devices of mine. So. In essence, uh, it's an interesting technology to get involved in, but I notice that there's some precautions one needs to take if you're having too much drawing of, from the electromagnetic jitter of, of um, zero-point energy. You're going to get a, m a minor meltdown. And I had to clean this area out here once because of a minor meltdown. Would a new energy source be dangerous, for example? I would, I would say, of course you have to respect it. I mean, it's energy, so therefore, it's always potentially dangerous. It's double-edged. And I think it's, it would take a healthy respect to, to investigate it. One should be cautious, and that's, that's very reasonable. I've heard some good things. I've heard there could be health effects. There could be good effects as well as the potential for detrimental effects. I think it's like anything else. It's energy. It could be used for good. It could be used for bad. It's up to us. Perhaps because of their traditional understanding of invisible forces like chi or ki, oriental cultures, especially the techno-enthusiastic Japanese, embrace the concept of free energy. Well-respected scientists like Senichi Siki and Zehuji Inomata are receiving substantial government and industry support. Meanwhile, the Japanese, of course, are beginning to commercially develop various systems uh, for example, uh, a Japanese consortium funds the Pones and Fleshman work. Uh, the Japanese uh, Toshiba Corporation is working with Inamata, and various other corporations are coming together to develop free energy options. And of course, Japan has no vested interest in oil. They don't have any domestic source. So it's, it's in their best interest to be the first kid on the block uh, to make little gizmos that will replace our circuit breakers and internal combustion engines. To understand this machine, uh, you need, you know, mind change, paradigm shift in yourself, you know. So far, physics, ordinary science,